I'm here today to talk about air quality in highways. So let's get started. So the first thing I want people to understand is that while there are air, there's air pollution from all kinds of different sources out there in the world, um, if you live near a major road, for example, a highway, uh, traffic is the major source of pollution for you. And this is a graph prepared by University of Toronto researcher Greg Evans, um, which kind of nicely illustrates the difference between you know, what a typical background air pollution in, in a major city would be like versus near a highway. And one of the reasons that uh, highways tend to be the major source is that um, highways not only increase uh, the amount of vehicle kilometers traveled, so they actually induce people to drive more. Um, part of the understanding of why this happens is that uh, highways create kind of car-centered development, you know, d development that's far away, big parking lots, and this actually causes people to drive more. Um, so you get more total air pollution because people are driving more. The other reason that highways are a major source of air pollution is that they concentrate the pollutants along a single corridor. From before 2006, the older diesel trucks caused the most harmful air pollutants. And highways tend to attract that type of vehicle. Um, and then the other thing that they do is they cause congestion, again, of most dangerous air pollution truck traffic along the access points to the highway. So you get backups along the regional roads where there's an interchange to the highway um, and then all of the you know, areas along those regional road access points also get elevated levels of pollution. Traffic-related air pollution has a lot of very serious health effects. You're probably all familiar with um, the traffic-related air pollution impacts to things like asthma. But in the last five or six years, uh, the research has really shown that traffic-related air pollution causes a very wide range of very serious health impacts. So um, cardiovascular disease is one that we've known about for a long time, but there's a whole wide range of cardiovascular disease that is caused by traffic-related air pollution, reduced lung function in addition to things like asthma. Um, and for children who live very close to a highway, it actually causes impaired lung development. So um, their lungs don't develop properly. It's not just that they get other symptoms like asthma. Um, and uh, one of the, the newest things that people have realized about traffic-related air pollution is that it's very highly associated with low birth weight and preterm births. So during COVID, when there were lockdowns and people weren't driving, there was a dramatic fall in preterm births uh, because people were exposed to vastly less traffic-related air pollution. Um, and it's also associated with cancers uh, like childhood leukemia and uh, just premature death in general, so global premature death, premature mortality. But there's more. <laughs> it's now understood that traffic-related air pollution causes neurocognitive decline that it also causes neurodevelopmental disease in children. Um, there is a very strong link to Alzheimer's and Parkinson's that is now being more and more well understood. So uh, Parkinson's is a disease that takes a really long time to appear. So what happens with Parkinson's is that children who are exposed to high levels of traffic-related air pollution develop Parkinson's in old age. So this is something that is latent for a long period of time. A um, whole bunch of different cancers are associated with traffic-related air pollution, um, eczema, uh, susceptibility to respiratory infections. Uh, there's known mechanisms by which respiratory infections become more accessible when there's, for example, high particulate matter, um, obesity, diabetes, and fertility. The list goes on. Okay, traffic-related air pollution is very, very, very bad for you. And I just want to get a sense, like when I say it's associated, this is not a weak association or like a very small um, association with many of these things. So this is an example, um, you know, if you live within that one to 100 meters of a highway, you have a almost 600% higher uh, chance of premature mortality. It's not a little effect. 
when the Ministry of Transportation did uh, the traffic related air pollution analysis for the Bradford bypass, they looked at what they call critical receptors. So people who might be particularly vulnerable to air pollution, like children, people recreating, that kind of thing. Uh, Simcoe County Greenbelt Coalition did their own analysis and found that Ministry of Transportation had missed a bunch of sensitive locations. So for example, they found a daycare next to the interchange in Bradford, um, which is not really a, a good thing to be located there. Um, so these are all things that uh, Ministry of Transportation didn't look at in their analysis. And so if you look at the at the legend there, the, the ones in orange are the ones that the Ministry of Transportation missed and Simcoe County Greenbelt found. And it's it's at the back too. Just to give you a sense of well, what are what are the effects in Ontario. So this is based on old 2016 Health Canada data published in the Ontario Auditor General's report and I think about 2020. And uh, this is an estimate based on the old science from 2016. So we now know a lot more about traffic-related air pollution impacts than we did back then. And back then, the annual estimated deaths, not illness, deaths, was 6,500 some odd people in Ontario. Of course, we can't leave out greenhouse gas emissions um, because we have uh, the effect of highways, uh, a well-known set of researchers in Toronto that showed that the more kilometers of highway you build, the more people drive. So we know that the highway will cause an increase in greenhouse gas emissions. Vehicle emissions are already the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in Ontario. They're the fastest growing source of greenhouse gas emissions in Ontario. So instead of controlling the problem, we're exacerbating it with additional vehicle kilometers of highway. And a lot of this increase is caused by the heavier vehicles. So the SUVs and light trucks, as well as the heavy diesel truck increase in volume of traffic. So you must be thinking, well, surely the government protects us from dangerous levels of air pollution. Surely they're acting on this. Surely there are rules around how much air pollution you can allow in, in a community. Unfortunately, there is not. In Ontario, we have non-binding ambient air quality guidelines. Um, many of those guidelines are woefully out of date, not based on the current understanding of things like neurocognitive decline and other issues that are caused particularly by diesel emissions. And just to give you a sense, um, so the first four pollutants are kind of the core traffic-related air pollution pollutants. You can see that Ontario's air quality guideline is uh, significantly higher for some of those items like uh, fine particulate matter. Um, I've, I've just included the 24-hour averages just because of space. The World Health Organization's most recent guidance is far more progressive than Ontario's guidance. And one of the problems we have in Ontario is that there are no rules. So if the government makes a decision to allow something that would exceed the ambient air quality guidelines, um, there's nothing preventing them from doing that. They're just guidelines. Um, and there are places in, for example, in England, uh, there used to be, and in the EU, there used to be binding air quality standards, which meant the government was not allowed to approve things that would exceed them. And you can see the impact on, of highways on the level of air pollution in these air modeling maps, which I'm showing you from Toronto Public Health. In the Harris years, we got rid of all the air monitoring stations, so there's not enough air monitoring stations to monitor properly air quality by highways, but Toronto Public Health attempted to model them. So this is a nitrogen dioxide near the uh, highways in Toronto. And you can see how being, like there's a fairly wide corridor along each highway, which is severely impacted. This is uh, larger particulate matter, same pattern, uh, generally a little bit less on the Don Valley Parkway for some reason, already modeling it to basically double the World Health Organization standard in those corridors. For benzene, the background levels of benzene have dropped since the original 2002 EA, um, but we're still uh, getting exceedances of even Ontario's out-of-date air quality standards along Highway 401 from the Toronto Public Health Modeling. So what does MTO do with this information? Well, um, 
first of all, I, I haven't mentioned this in previous uh, uh, town halls, but MTO doesn't acknowledge that highways increase vehicle kilometers traveled. So that's the first problem, um, even though it's, it's, it's a known law of traffic modeling. There is no legal obligation for MTO to protect anybody from air quality that might exceed those standards. And as part of this environmental assessment process, the MTO has refused for years to do any health impact study, so act to actually assess you know, how many people will get sick, uh, you know, what should the no-go zone be around this highway, because, you know, the science shows there probably shouldn't be people living right next to the highway, there probably shouldn't be people working right next to the highway, there definitely shouldn't be daycares next to the highway or recreational trails. Um, I find it really disturbing when I hear, uh, you know, political commentators say, this highway is environmentally friendly because we're going to put a recreational trail on it. Well, you shouldn't be... <laughs> going on a recreational trail next to a very polluted corridor that is not a good thing to be doing. MTO has a guidance on how they'll assess air quality. The bypass is not subject to that guidance because of the exemption regulation, and they've not committed to follow the guidance. Um, so really there's nothing. This is the most recent environmental screening report where they looked at background air quality before the highway goes in. And uh, the MTO, I mean, the nearest air quality monitor they used was on Eagle Street in Newmarket, which is not close by. I mean, air monitors are not that expensive. It costs you know, a few hundred, maybe $1,000 to stick an air monitor along the highway corridor. But they didn't even do that. They used the one in Newmarket. And that uh, station is already exceeding for fine particulate matter. And this is before the wildfires. This is before. Um, any of that kind of uh, concern was happening the, from this summer's wildfire season. Um, and also very close to the, the uh, Ontario Air Standard for nitrogen dioxide too. So the other problem is that there's plans to put employment lands all along the 404 corridor, all along the 400 corridor, all along the bypass corridor. And what is the cumulative effect of emissions from those employment lands? with the highway on both regional and local air quality. We don't know because Ontario has for years refused to assess the cumulative impacts of multiple sources of air emissions. And this is something that EcoJustice has previously tried to address in Sarnia, which is a very, very polluted community. And we were able to get Ontario to agree to assess cumulative emissions only in Sarnia and Hamilton, so only in severely impacted air sheds. So they won't be doing that here. And so what that means for things like the Bradford Business Park, which will be next to the highway, is that each um, industrial emitter will be treated like they're all by themselves. So they can emit, you know, likely anything up to the air quality guidelines, or they can get a site-specific standard to exceed the air quality guidelines without the highway being factored in at all. So this is what the planning documents say it's going to look like all along these corridors. And again, you know, people really probably shouldn't be spending eight hours a day working right next to a highway, first of all. Secondly, they, you certainly don't want to put the industrial emitters next to the highway. That is not a good idea, but that's the plan. So what have health experts said about these kinds of things? Well, um, Health Canada responded to the original environmental assessment with a very, very strongly worded uh, submission to Ontario saying that um, the MTO's assessment was looking at pieces of the highway in isolation from the, from the you know, other emitters, that Ontario was using old air quality standards, surprise, surprise, that were out of date, and this was back in 2000, they're still out of date. Um, and it uh, hasn't really gotten any better. When we requested a federal environmental assessment, Health Canada weighed in again in 2021. Health Canada said very similar things. Air quality human health impacts are not well identified and described, and that hasn't changed on June 1st with the new impact assessment. So what does that new impact assessment say, the one from June 1st? Well, of course, no health impact assessment, no cumulative effects assessment. We um, don't really have within that study uh, a transparent description of what they looked at or what they found. They only gave the peak 
amounts for each air contaminant that they looked at. And of course, the standards are all in averages. So the peaks don't tell me if air quality guidelines would be exceeded, for example. It also has a very vague description of what the assumptions were about future vehicle traffic. Do they assume that all the 2006 trucks are off the road? Do they assume that all the cars are electric cars? I don't know because they haven't given me that information. I did request it, I think on June 1st or June 2nd. I asked for the air dispersion modeling so I could see the map, just like the Toronto Public Health map. They didn't give it to me. Um, I asked for the averages, they didn't give them to me. So I don't know. Without that information, I can't really say much more. Um, and so that's what we're left with. So what do we need? We need a full health impact assessment. I mean, that should just be standard for any highway development. We should not be building highways without understanding you know, where, where the safe places that people can live are. We should not be having condos right next to the Gardner Expressway with children in them. That is just not scientifically defensible. And we should have access to the dispersion modeling that the MTO did. I mean, that should be publicly available without having to get in a big fight about it. I mean, that June 1st report was posted for a 30-day public consultation, and I still have no response from the traffic, from the project team asking for the air dispersion modeling. So that tells you how much they care what we think. And, you know, ultimately, what we need to do is shift to lower impact forms of transportation. It is just not... You know, we have a growing population and it is not sustainable for everyone to drive everywhere. It's ultimately going to take a toll on our health, not just greenhouse gas emissions. Um, you know, we're all concerned about climate change, but there's going to be a more direct and immediate impact on this community, which is now going to be surrounded on all three sides by highways. And it, I want you to think back to that um, Toronto Public Health map and what it means to be surrounded on three sides by highways. And this is something that keeps me awake at night when I think about this community, um, because it, it really is a, a potentially serious thing, especially for children living here. All right, so that's it. I hope I didn't bum everyone out too much, but uh, I hope maybe we learned some stuff. <laughs>